Hi everyone, I'm Mima Carmo and you're watching Breathe TV, a safe space to come to, to exhale and to breathe as you navigate your cancer journey. When I first heard the words you had cancer, my world stopped and I, I stopped breathing. And I thought, what would it be like to have a space to have patients come to, to see people who look like them, who understood their journey, who helped them to exhale and feel like they can go through this with support, community, love, um, new friendship and empowerment. And so now we have Breathe TV, which is that space. My guest today is a very special guest for me. She's actually my little cousin who I've known my entire life. She's a beautiful, a talented dancer. I think it was it four years ago when you got diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma? Well, I got diagnosed in 2021. <laughs> So, um, um, so three years now. Almost three years now, yeah. Right. I mean, I will share her story with you, but first, when you have cancer, it's hard to deal with cancer. But having someone you love have cancer is a whole different ballgame. I remember her mom texting me and then calling me and saying that the first thing I felt was sheer terror. Like, I'm like, how can we get this thing out of her body? You know, then you and I talked and I was like, you know what? We can't accept any other option, but that you're going to be fine one day. And so sitting with you here today is making my heart so full. And I'm so proud of you. Not only are you, um, you're a thriver, but you're doing things about it. You're sharing your story, you're advocating and helping other patients navigate their journey. So Amina, Amina, what was it like being diagnosed with cancer in your early twenties? Being a young adult with a cancer diagnosis is very scary, but also very confusing. I was in my final year of school in New York, dancing full time, working part-time, trying to have a social life. And then I just got sick out of nowhere and I didn't know what it was. So when you say you got sick, what, did that, what were symptoms you were feeling? So the symptoms I was feeling was crazy, crazy fatigue. Like going up a flight of stairs would have me out of breath. And being a dancer, like I'm a very athletic, active person. So just walking upstairs doesn't make me tired. I'm used to dancing full length ballets and full evening works. But after like 30 minutes in my ballet class, I'd be huffing and puffing. I found that I didn't really have an appetite and I couldn't sleep through the night because I would wake up covered in sweat. And that's when I knew something was really, really off and it had to be more serious than what some of the doctors were telling me it was. So you're, you're experiencing fatigue, you are having night sweats, um, and then you start seeing doctors. I remember you calling me and telling me that the things you had to go through to get diagnosed, mm -hmm. the delays, people aren't following up with you, and you are advocating for yourself. Um, can you share what it was like during the pandemic, was it around the COVID, just in the middle of it, is it when this happened? Yeah, so it was starting to happen as things were slowly opening up but kind of to put things into perspective, I was in class with a mask, like a KN95 mask all the time. We had to stay socially distant. And dancing in a mask is already hard. Being fatigued and dancing in a mask is even harder. And so I, I was always going to the doctor, always leaving school early to get checked out because every other week there was something wrong. I went to my gynecologist because I found a lump in my groin and I thought it might be an ovarian cyst, and so did they, but the process of getting that diagnosed took a month because that's just the normal like timeline that they have for those things. So when we realized that it was something more serious, then it goes on to getting blood work, which is another waiting period. And then at that point, my gynecologist can't help me because she's out of her depth. Yeah. So I was, a college student in a new city that's not my hometown with no primary care physician and kind of trying to um, kind of finding my way through minute clinics and uh, emergency care centers that really just are meant to treat in and out patients and don't really have um, any connection or relationship to the people that walk into the room with them which made the process of getting my diagnosis really hard because I had no record of my history and no one could understand why a perfectly healthy 21 year old 
looks ill. So that was really frustrating for me, is not having the answers and not being surrounded by professionals who could provide them. So at some point you had to go home because your mom called and said, Mina's coming home, something's really wrong, right? When did you realize that this is not a mini clinic situation? It's like something really is not good here and I need to get advanced, you know, more support. Some people your age would have said, you know what, I'm just tired, I'm gonna wait it out. But you realize that something was really, bad, really, really wrong mm -hmm. and that you just couldn't, you couldn't wait any longer for to get a diagnosis. And then, you know, knowing that and acting on it's a big, pretty big deal, right? Yeah, so the process of minute clinics and trying to get answers started in early January. By July, I had been admitted to the hospital for pneumonia and anemia. And that's when they realized like, oh, she might have cancer. And at that point, I was tired of being passed around by different physicians and different doctors. And I knew that if I was going to get treatment, if everything that they thought was right, then I would want to do it at home where I could be supported by my family. Yeah. And so what was it, what did it feel like? You're in, you know, you're in your prime, you're dancing, you're on stages, you're like, your Instagram pictures are so beautiful. You're soaring, you're in the air and that's what you love to do. And then this kind of, this thing happens. What was that like? It was devastating, honestly. I, I was really, really upset. I thought that everything around me was crumbling and that my career would be over. At that point, you know, when you finish school, everyone is auditioning. Everyone's going to the next step of their career and beginning to prosper, which is what I had always envisioned for myself. I had a very clear plan uh, and I knew what I wanted to do next. So it felt like that was being taken away from me. And where were you in school? You say it so casually. <laughs> I was studying at uh, the Ailey School in Manhattan. Um, so it's, the Alvin Ailey School. <laughs> yes. The she Alvin says Ailey. I was at school like it's some kind of like, you know, you were at a very prestigious school that you you worked hard to get into and to stay and you're one of the best in the school. You're, I mean, you're, that's a really, really a great place to be and it's world well renowned, right? So you're at top of your game in a top of your game type, you know, institution when this happens. Mm -hmm. So you come home and you find looking for a doctor and that was a process to find the right team for you, right? Yes and no, because uh, my mom is, was really my rock during that period. So as soon as the word lymphoma was even whispered, she was doing her research. We knew that I didn't want to get treated in New York and I wanted to go home. So we reached out to family and connections we had here in DC to get more information on Johns Hopkins. What was it like one minute you're dancing and preparing for your career and your, the next the future? Next minute you have to understand what Hodgkin's lymphoma is, mm -hmm. treatment options, you know, staging. It's a lot to, to learn in a huge shift from art to like cancer world. How did you absorb all the information that you were getting exposed to? I honestly don't know because I was getting one thing from my doctors, one thing from family and friends who always mean well but don't know everything. And then a lot of it was YouTube University. Oh no, that's the worst. <laughs> I know. But I, I always joke, I was like, oh, this is the one time that WebMD got it right. <laughs> like all the symptoms was actually cancer or the, the worst possible outcome. But the, the biggest thing that helped me absorb other people's information was talking to other thrivers and survivors like you, uh, like the community I made on social media, and just knowing that other people have gone through this, these are the possible solutions, these are the possible outcomes, and yeah, just to know that anything is possible and mm -hmm. to not let the fear of a diagnosis or the diagnosis get the best of me. Yeah. As you were getting diagnosed, you had a concern that you may have breast cancer. And you told me that you were told by a physician or somebody that you were too young to have breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, what was going through your mind at that point? Because you were trying to figure out what what in the world's happening right now and you're being told you're too young, but you, you thought, if I want to know whatever this is. So how did you navigate being told something, your body saying something different? and then figuring out the next step. 
Well, I think the reason my mind went to breast cancer was because with lymphoma, your your lymph nodes are inflamed. Mm. So when I'm feeling a lump in my groin, in my stomach, or in my chest area, I'm like, uh, I don't I don't know what this is. And that was the only thing that my mind was familiar with. So that was the first thing I brought up. And the doctor told me I was too young and that the chances of me having breast cancer at 21 were low. Um, but also in combination with my other symptoms and the fact that there were lumps and inflamed nodes in other places, they said it would most likely be lymphoma. And Hodgkin specifically has um, a higher chance of affecting people 15 to 30. So I was within that margin. How do you feel about, you know, how your life changed? Because your your life is now what it once was, but you have a whole other world now where you're sharing your story like you are today. You love to get people educated, young people, anybody aware of the risk of cancer because you were, again, in your prime when this happened to you. Well, your prime's not even started yet, by the way. <laughs> your prime's at my age. But um, I really love seeing that you're advocating for other patients and, and sharing. For anybody watching this right now who's living with cancer and who's young, um, you're not alone. There are people like Amina who's cool have gone through this who are here to, to share, to support you, to be your community. What would you tell somebody who's your age um, watching who's going through this right now? I would tell them to trust their gut and to not let anyone, regardless of their position in the room, silence you or diminish your concerns because whatever you're feeling is valid and only you truly understand what your body is going through. In terms of like community, you know, you found a community that you didn't have before. Mm -hmm. What was it like to realize people love you because of you, but they love your spirit? And as you gave of yourself, that community grew. Some people who are who are in treatment don't can't even fathom sharing with other people that they're they have cancer. They can't fathom telling their story in public or that advocacy could be a whole other part of their beautiful part of their lives. You know, so what would you share with someone watching about the importance of the, the power of sharing because um, you can feel so alone during cancer, mm -hmm. but when you realize there's somebody here who's been through this, somebody here going through that, there's others, you find your tribe building around you and that is such a beautiful thing. Yeah, it really is. I think having a community to support you is super important. As Mema mentioned, cancer can be very isolating. However, I found that sharing my story and sharing my experiences not only showed me who my real friends are, but showed me that there is so many other people out there that I didn't even know going through the same things that I'm going through or who have felt comforted by my story. So what has having cancer taught you about life and living? You know, at first I thought it was telling me that life is short and I definitely felt the need to hold on to things from my life before cancer and it felt like a, a desperate attempt to grasp on to like the old me, I guess you could say. But now um, being a year into my remission, I found that life is funny. Life can be very fickle and sometimes terrible things happen um, just to show you how strong you are and how persistent I can be. And that, you know, if anything, I feel like my experience fortified me as a person and anything is possible regardless of the hardships that we go through. Yeah, because now you're speaking, you're traveling, you're doing all these things. I mean, I remember your first speaking engagement when you called me and said, what do I do and how do I do this? And, and now you're out there doing the thing. Yeah. Would you ever imagine doing that back like three years ago? No, not at all. <laughs> Uh, I definitely had a tunnel vision on a, a career as a professional dancer. But now after my experience and getting the opportunity to share my story on larger platforms, I've shown that I do have a variety of skills that- And talent. <laughs> yeah, and that I, I'm comfortable speaking, you know, not only here with you, but to other people and to strangers and basically showing them like the power of advocacy and why it's so, so important. 
I love that. And so you have a catchphrase you use. What, what is it? Uh, battling cancer like a boss. I love that, yeah. like a boss. Um, where did that come from? Honestly, it, it was kind of speaking things into existence. Uh, as we mentioned before, like my cancer treatment, my diagnosis was very isolating. I was living independently in New York and then I had to move back home to DC with my family and I felt like I didn't have control over anything. And so the battling cancer like a boss, which was a hashtag I would use on my social media, was kind of like trying to improve my self-confidence, not only with how I felt on the inside, but also my appearance, like losing my hair, losing weight, then gaining it from steroids. It, it was really hard for me, especially as someone who works very hard on my physique as an athlete. So I had to remind myself like at the end of the day, you're a boss, you're going through something really tough, but you know, you look good doing it. So you, you did. I mean, I remember you sending me a picture before you cut your hair and you had beautiful long hair and you're like, I'm cutting my hair soon. Then you cut your hair and send me a picture of afterwards. And I thought like, she's so beautiful. Like, I really feel like her face, just like your beauty came out because I could see your strength in your eyes. Mm -hmm. There wasn't hair on the way. It was just Amina, right? And I think that was just so powerful becoming a boss, embracing where you were, where you are now, which brought you to your one your, your other purpose, pretty mm -hmm. much, you know? For those who are watching, who are, who are living with Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, can you share what Hodgkin's is? symptom signs, and then what it does to your body? Yeah. Hodgkin's lymphoma is a disease that infects the lymphatic system. So it starts in the lymph nodes in your body. And signs that you may have Hodgkin's are swollen or enlarged lymph nodes either in your neck, armpit, or growing. And it tends to affect people ages 15 to 30, as well as older adults over the age of 60. Another sign that you might have Hodgkin's lymphoma is drastic weight loss, serious fatigue, and night sweats. And so if somebody's feeling these symptoms, what would you advise them to do? I would advise you to contact your primary care physician right away. If you're like me and you didn't have a primary care physician, go to a doctor that you can trust to get blood work. Something that I've actually started doing, uh, not only with my own remission, uh, program, but having to get blood work done regularly and knowing what my baseline health is, is really, really important to monitor uh, my progress. Right. What was your treatment like? So my treatment was seven months of chemotherapy and how, I- How often? I got it once a week for five hours. So I would go into the transfusion center, sit down five hours, watch TV, eat some snacks, talk to my dad. And then I would go home. And when they sent me home, I had this on-body device, which kind of looked like a, a tracker. And that would give me medication at home in addition to other pills that I would take, antiviral, antibacterial, to assist in the um, recovery process. And so, yeah, I did that every week for seven months. And then what is your maintenance now? What is maintenance and screening right now? Right now, I'm still at the three month stage. So I meet with my oncologist, hematologist every three months to do blood work and just look at how I'm doing. And mm -hmm. so far, so good. You look great. Mina went through cancer treatment and came out of it battling it like a boss. And she thought, I'm over this, I'm through the fire, I'm on the other side. But then your life changed again. Mm -hmm. your, tell, tell the viewers what happened to, within the family. So before I reached a year into my remission, um, at the beginning of this year in January, I found out that my father was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. And that is a tough, tough pill to swallow. Yeah, it was hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember thinking, you know, how much can they handle, right? Yeah, he got a bone marrow transplant and because of my previous diagnosis, I couldn't be a donor. My brother's only 14, he was too young, so I left my sister. 
and Nanichi. She, yeah, Nanichi. She donated a liter of her bone marrow to him. Wow. Yeah, which is pretty amazing because you know Nichi's a little. She's tiny. She's tiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's a little thing, but it it was beautiful, you know. Yeah, and when I watch what you all and your mom has some health issues as well. Mm -hmm. Mommy has something going on. Amina's just coming out of her journey. Mm -hmm. Now your dad's going through this. And he's just giving him her bone marrow. Um, it's tough, but it, it's beautiful, right? That you guys could support each other in your journey. And um, I remember your dad had a hard time at first with your cancer. And like, and we talked about that because he was like, he just, he's like, this is not really happening. He came around, of course, because he was scared. You know, yeah. he was scared. Whereas women can be like, okay, I'm here. I'm, they, they're so emotional. Mm -hmm. Sometimes men, like, they'll close up because they want to show that they're brave. My brother did that too. He couldn't express how he felt. So he just kind of was like showing up, very like straight face, mm -hmm. not too much talking. And I'm like, what's going on? But I realized, you told me recently that he was so scared to lose me that he couldn't bear yeah. expressing his feelings, you know. And then with your dad coming, you know, to finally being in his feelings and saying how he felt and then him getting cancer. Um, and then you guys are now in this unit where you're kind of, so connected in different ways, right? Different way. Mm -hmm. um, how has all of that happened? Changed your family, brought you closer? I mean, my dad definitely really empathizes with me now. And it's kind of very interesting how life can work out because he would always be the one to take me to my infusions every Thursday. And now I was traveling back and forth between New York and Baltimore to be his 24 hour caregiver. So I would be with him in Baltimore while he's getting treatment and being checked out at Johns Hopkins during the week, go to New York on the weekends, come back. And I did that uh, May and June of this year. So like you said, it definitely has fortified us, but crazily enough, my experience helped my dad in terms of getting his treatment faster because mm. leukemia is a beast and my father is very very strong yes to be fighting and, and pulling through the way he is but all i had to do was message my oncologist on my chart and be like can you help my dad this is what's going on and so i i'm so grateful that he did not have to wait as long as i did because the results could have been drastically different and so in a way, you going through that, learning all you learned, helped your dad to have different experience, right? Because you were so educated and empowered and knew how to, in a way, help him advocate for himself. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's almost like I had to go through what I went through in order for his experience to be smoother, hmm. which is Crazy. kind of twisted, but yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. what it is. How is he doing now? He's, he's doing better. The treatment is long. And his recovery process is taking a long time, but he should be getting discharged this month and coming back home. So I'm really excited about that. That's awesome. Yeah. You got diagnosed and you learned way after that it was stage four. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Honestly, I had a moment of like aftershock, you know, like kind of like when an earthquake happens and it rumbles and then hours later it's boom again. I was going through my reports, just preparing for my three month follow up. And then I see in my description, Amina Vargas, age 23, stage four Hodgkins. And I was like, what? So no one told you the so whole time? They told me it was most likely stage 3B because of my symptoms and because of the way it spread. And my treatment is the same. So. The treatment for stage three and stage four Hodgkin's is the same uh, chemo cocktail, mm -hmm. as they would say. And we had to start right away. So within a week of all my tests and stuff, when I got to DC, I was starting treatment. I, however, was not um, keeping up with the reports and reading them. So when the official pathology report came in, uh, the doctor wrote in the notes, good news, there's no cancer in the bone marrow. And now I'm looking back at my reports, getting ready for my follow-ups. Now I'm in remission and I see, oh, stage four Hodgkin's. And they like, should tell you though. What? That's kind of crazy. I mean, they should tell you, right? Yeah. And so what does that mean? So you're stage four, 
but right now you're NED, no evidence of disease. Yes. Um, and so stage monitoring for stage zero or one or two or three is different from stage four because you know you're gonna you're gonna always be checking all the time because stage four means that the cancer has kind of gone to other parts of your body. Mm -hmm. so, but but right now it's just non-existent, right? Exactly. So you're gonna always be checking up like on a every month, like three month basis, six month basis. What does that look like for you? So right now I'm on the three month basis for the next year or so. I've been doing my three months checkups for about a year. And in 2024, fingers crossed, I'll move up to six months and it'll slowly progress like that. I'll do the six months checkup for another two years then I'll move on to a one-year checkup. And at the five-year mark, you are considered cured with Hodgkin's. That's awesome. Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to that. I'll be 28 by then. Wow, so proud of you. Yeah. And so um, you mentioned that you, this is a, of course, unwanted challenge, right? Mm -hmm. But it really has changed how you, because you had a one, here's my goal, dancing, that's it. I'm an athlete and that's where I'm going and this is it, right? Performance. Now you have cancer advocacy. Mm -hmm. um, do you see yourself blending both your artistry and advocacy? I really do. So at the beginning of this year, I worked with one of my teachers from school. His name is Earl Mosley. And he has a benefit concert called Dance Against Cancer. And I had the honor of being one of the hosts for the performance as well as performing in it as a way to raise money and raise awareness um, for cancer treatment. And that was really, really fulfilling because not only did I get to share my experience and my story, but I also got to do what I love and perform. And that was awesome. That's wonderful. And so I love seeing how you've evolved. You know, at first kind of thinking, I got this, I'm good. and. You learn to ask for help, receive help, give help to other people. As someone who's been through cancer, it can be hard to ask for help sometimes. But when you ask for help, it's amazing how people come around you and come to you to support you as you navigate your journey. Mm -hmm. People want to love you if you let them in. And the community that can come around you as people who are strangers even, family and friends, is so beautiful. Can you share a bit about like how you felt? Because you are living in New York, you're independent. Then now you're with your parents at home and having to get help and things like that. But how did being able how did being able to receive change you? It changed me in the sense that I think before I was afraid to show that I need help. I was afraid to ask. I saw it as a sign of weakness. But then I learned that. There is more strength in community. Mm -hmm. Like there's literally support and that there are people who you may not even realize are in your corner and supporting you. And as soon as you open not only your mind, but your heart to accepting that love and support, it, it's so fulfilling. It's so fulfilling and it's so much better than trying to struggle in silence. Yeah. My question for you is, how has providing this platform of Breathe TV benefited you in return? Because you are helping so many people by having this calming space. And so I, I wonder if there's any return. Oh my God, I'm gonna get teary. You know, for me, just like you, Mina, like I didn't have, I didn't have people my age when I got diagnosed. I didn't know people that had the same stage and type of cancer I had. And one thing I remember going to the doctor's office and there was so much of like, they, they made me feel more afraid than I already was. There was like a rush and urgency and like, I kept hearing death and these really heavy words. And I thought, what if right now I can't even breathe, I can't even think. They would talk to me and I, my body wouldn't, my mind wouldn't process. There were so much things coming at me. And I felt like the world was spinning fast and I couldn't grasp onto, like you said, like I couldn't hold onto anything. There's no, my, my whole flooring was written from under me. And I thought, what if it was, what if I came to, to a doctor's office and they said, you know, give me your hands, um, take a deep breath, you have breast cancer. I get that it is scary, but just breathe. Yeah. We're gonna protect you. We're gonna do our, the best we can, we can do for you. We're gonna take care of you, give you support, but just, you know, just know that you're held in a space that's of safety, of sacredness, of, of good energy and just, you know, we're here. We're gonna hold you until you can walk on your own again. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, just breathe. 
I didn't have that. And, and as I've seen other patients going through this, there's so much fear in the space of cancer. What if people knew that cancer could be a catalyst? Or any challenge you go through could be a catalyst, right? But that you can breathe while you're going through that traumatic experience. I watch people being interviewed on countless shows about breast cancer. I've been on countless things myself. And there's always this kind of like the interviewer is like an interviewer. There's not a warmth of like, you know, like, like us talking, like yeah. just talking. And so it was literally during the pandemic and I was like, hey, I went to a TV show because the entire world separated, right? The entire world's like apart. So when you have cancer, you're alone. And now you have people in this pandemic can't even see their moms and dads and siblings. And I thought, nobody's breathing right now. And it was actually like during the pandemic that people were, couldn't breathe, right? They were breathing stuff and they could kill them. Mm -hmm. So I thought I have to do this right now. And I got people to support it. And they said, do you really want to call this breathe? I said, yes, because even more than just having cancer, the entire world collectively is dying to breathe. And I think it's important they know that they can find a place to come to and just do that. And it was only a dream during the pandemic. And now it's, we're in our fourth season. So I think love is something that's so powerful. And when you can plant seeds of love and give people love, hope, energy, um, self-acceptance, like that is something that, and resilience, like that's something that I just, it fills my heart. Yeah, and I, I really feel that because something I express not only to my family, but to friends at home is that my experience with cancer didn't end when I rang the bell. Mm -hmm. Like it is something that affects me and is still affecting me and will affect me for the rest of my life. Not only like when I look in the mirror and I see my port scars or my surgical scars, like every time I see that it takes me back there. So the healing process is ongoing, which is why the space you're providing is so special. Thank you, babe. Thanks, sweetie. It's, it's funny what you said, because um, even in doing this work, as you mentioned, the healing process takes time. Mm -hmm. I am still healing. I didn't have the resources that people have now. We didn't have like, you had to pay for your own coach or a therapist. You had to get all these things yourself. Acupuncture, Reiki, it wasn't even offered to me as a, as a, as a patient. But no one talked about the trauma of cancer and the kind of cancer I had, triple negative breast cancer, until now it has no targeted treatment, none. Mm -hmm. And so my parents were like, okay, you're done with treatment. Family's really happy. Your mom came over. Everybody's like, oh my God, she's done. But I'm like, they have no idea that I'll never be done. You know, it's one thing to have treatment targeting your body and you do, you get that and, and you know you've had something, but I've never had anything that targets triple negative breast cancer. It doesn't exist. And so my journey um, of healing for a long time, I lived in fear. A recurrence. I saw my friends who got targeted therapies dying. I thought, oh my God, they had everything and they're dying. What about, you know, mm -hmm. will I have life? And so the journey for me too has been to give, to create magazine programs, you know, like this and others to create my living legacy. I want to give people all the things that I didn't have. Yeah. And so I think when something, when you're squeezed in life, for me, when I was under the pressure of like, oh my God, I might die, I thought, what could I dream up and manifest that could help other people that feel hopeless and feel alone? And I thought I wouldn't live to be even five years post-cancer. Now I'm 17 years cancer-free. And so I, I just would say to the guests who are watching, like, anything's possible. Don't let anyone give you a timestamp or the final say. But most importantly, like, what you do with your cancer diagnosis is what really matters. We're all here for a time. How do you make that time beautiful, magical, epic? Um, how do you manifest your dreams, desires, and hopes? How do you not put off? You mentioned time in the beginning. Life is so short. Actually, when life is when life is being lived, it's actually quite long. There's so much you can do in that time. And so I thought I have five years, and I put all I could put into that five years. And then I had one more year, and five more years, and more years. And so don't think that you're in a box. I would say um, take the box, cut a hole, get out of it, put it on the shelf, create an epic life and um that's what you're about you're battling like a boss you're battling cancer like a boss you're living life like a boss and i feel like cancer has changed you so much it's changed me so much and most of all cancers made me dream bigger dream the impossible thing and so um we're going to have more breathe tv we're going to launch more magazines we're going to help more people um and we're going to love people harder and so you know just love yourself love your family members love your friends 
give yourself the love and then give it away. And that's the best way to live. Um, thanks for watching everyone. This has been a really special episode with my little cousin, Amina, seeing what a lovely woman she's become. I'm so proud of you and what you're gonna, what you have done, what you are doing and what you will do in the future. Thank you. Okay. I love you. I love you too. Yes, <laughs> hard, hard. <laughs> everyone, thanks for watching. And um, I know that you've been as touched by this episode as I am by Amina's story. Um, but um, thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. And know that you are loved, you are safe, and you can breathe in this moment. Until next time, much love and bye for now.